Well, I want to welcome everybody. Here we are. Big pause number. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm top, Pastor Tom, I lost count. I think we are at like number 11, being in the pandemic. Uh, for those people that don't know, this is Pastor Tom Richter. Uh, I have told our church, Pastor Tom, for a while that I was going to have this conversation. And we are so glad to see your face and to hear your voice. Uh, again, if you don't know, Pastor Tom was formerly a pastor, senior pastor of New Hope Church in Jamaica, Queens. Yeah. And now he is the pastor of the uh, Coleman First Baptist Church in Coleman, Alabama. Roll Tide, roll. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a little different, right? New York and Alabama. You hardly notice. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is so good to have you, my brother. Oh, man. So Family good. Family doing well? Yes, James, it's so good to see your face. Uh, I love City on a Hill Community Church. I love you guys. Uh, I think about you. What, what is it the Apostle Paul says in Philippians? Like, I thank my God every time I remember. You know, <laughs> he, he knows all these churches, but right. Philippi is always like right here in his heart. That's how I feel about, about your family and your church, man. Absolutely. Well, we feel the same. We, you know, people miss you, and uh, we're hoping at some point, maybe in the not so distant yes. future, we can. Uh, we can have you up here and see you in person. Yeah, I think I think you can get a plane ticket to New York right now for like <laughs> That's a good idea right now. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's it's tough. Pay what you want. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. Hey, so I just you know, I thought we would just dialogue, you know, for a few yes. minutes. I'd just ask you a couple of questions and yep. you know, get your perspective and your insight and your wisdom. And uh, so hey, here's my first question. What do you see as a few of the real challenges that the church in America faces today. Yeah. Say to that. What do you, what are we up against? Yeah. I, so I'm, um, I'm actually teaching in a series right now on the book of Isaiah. <laughs> and so it's funny as you know, you sent me these questions and I was kind of mulling over them and, and thinking about them. Um, and it's like, all my responses are like, Isaianic, you know, they're all like, what would Isaiah say? You know, the sort of prophet. <laughs> and I even got to thinking, James, Isaiah was a prophet in the southern kingdom, and his yes. contemporary was Amos in the northern kingdom. So I was like, You're my Amos <laughs> to the northerners. And I'm like in Alabama. How many people, people got that? That's a good, that's good. Uh, that's but good. no, I, you know, and um, so I would say, I would say, pandemic or no pandemic, the right. real challenge hasn't changed. Uh, Pre-COVID or post, the real challenge, I think, for the church in America, it's the enduring problem of the church wherever they are, is, um, is how do we as God's people be in the world but not of it? Mm. So the enduring problem, Niebuhr would call it the problem of culture. Yes. Um, but that to me, that's the biggie. Um, you know, is there a... Um, like the hope, think about this for a second. Like sure. the hope for the world is right. God's church. Like, you know, his people passionately on fire for him and loving him and, and, and loving the people. Like that's the hope for the world. If the world is not experiencing the grace of God, that's a failure of the church. We must not be delighting in God like we're supposed to be. Um, and so, you know, I think like, um, you know, how to relate to the culture right now. Probably the opposite extremes. I think Tim Keller points this out in Center Church. You know, a church can be under-contextualized and over-contextualized. So the under-contextualized church always critiques, right? That's like the angry prophet, you know, yeah. the world today. Right. It's, it's going downhill and it's all garbage and we're to reject all of it. But that's right. under-contextualized, right? That doesn't do justice to the idea of common grace. That Wait, wait a minute. There's beauty in the world. There's love. There, come on. Yes. There can be some. Okay. But then there's over-contextualized, which is the church doesn't look any different than the world. Wow. And I ha if I had to pick one, I would say um, that's where we're failing. Um, we're calling people to convert. But, like, we need <laughs> – we, people need something to convert to. So and if we um, – and so the way good. we spend our money is so much like the way the world spends their money. Huh. If, the, if what we idolize is so much what, like what the world idolizes, if what we fear is what the world fears, if our, like, there's nothing to convert to. We look just like the world. Um, that, that to me, when you boil it all down, that's the, the, um, 
you know, in terms of the challenge the church faces, COVID-19 just exposes some of those idolatries that were already there. Love it. They don't, I don't think they create any new challenges. I mean, you saw how quickly the church can pivot. I mean, God's people are agile and nimble. I mean, we, we, we go, boom, we go online or we do this. I, those aren't the challenges. Those are systemic things. Those are surface things. But it's those, it's like down here, I just use a simple example, like one of the, I, you, you know, but like youth sports. I know this sounds crazy. I just you, mentioned it on Sunday in my oh, circle. But yeah, I did. Go ahead. No, go talk to that. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like such a small thing, but like that's become sort of a, I don't know, maybe an idol is too strong a word, but maybe it's not. But like, you don't see any difference in the way we're, we're, we're putting all our security in youth sports among Christians and non-Christians, you know? Um, do we see any real difference there? So that to me- You know, um, I said that's a good, you know, in talking about that Sunday, I said, that's a concern for me as a pastor that during this pause or that, you know, we're gonna go, when this ends for us, I mean, a little bit longer than maybe other areas in the country, but we're just gonna go back to the way we were doing things before. And, you know, I think God got, you know, got our attention. God didn't cause this, but God is using this in our lives. So I, I do, there is a sense of concern for me as a minister that people will just continue this living life the same way they did before. So that, and that, that definitely talks to uh, the, the issue of youth sports. I mean, there are a lot of other issues, but I would say it's idolatry. Go ahead. No, did you happen to see that Gospel Coalition article by Brett McCracken called Church, don't let coronavirus divide you. I did, yes. I Wasn't did that see. great? So oh, his point amazing. was, it, it was tell, kind of- Tell the people. Well, yes. it, 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 I don't want to steal your thunder. Just steal it. No, no, no. Just go ahead. Get, but like, it was kind of a head fake. It was kind of a pump fake. Because you think the title of the article is like, this is going to be about infighting in the church. But then he, right. he, it's really about how the church can show the world how to be utterly countercultural, countercultural in our patience with one another, countercultural in our humility, countercultural in the way, you know, and I just thought, man, that's it. Like, you know, do, does a Christian's Facebook post look any different than the world right now? Or is that low, that sort of latent anger, yeah. is that rage just <laughs> seething below the surface in a just and it shouldn't be there, you know? Yeah. Um, but he likens, and I thought this was great, he likens, um, the coronavirus and, and the fact is nobody really knows, but you've got these, anytime you dig in, you entrench this dogmatic position on something you may not be sure about. That's probably a recipe for disaster. Anyway, <laughs> but like um, he likens it to the Corinthian church when it came to food sacrifice to idols, when he talks about those who wear masks versus those who don't. I thought that was so, so good. Great, you know? So good. I love and that like, as well. well. Yeah, like, you know, those of you who, who wear the mask, yeah. show grace to those who feel Christian liberty not to wear the mask and don't immediately Ugh. sort of impute the worst possible motive. And in reverse, those who don't wear the mask, don't judge as being sort of legalistic, yeah. these that, that do. And you can obviously take that mask example and, ex and tease it out to oh, all sorts yeah. of metaphors. But I thought that was, it's that kind of thing. Like, like does the church handle... The, what, does the church do social media? And when I say the church, I don't mean, I don't mean the, the social media page of City on a Hill. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, oh, I get it, yeah. God's people it. as individuals, sure. do they look radically different in the way we do politics right now? Do we look radically different in the way we talk about uh, those things? We've really got a chance to shine like a star uh, uh, right now. Um, I had used, I had used in, in the sermon when I, you know, I was preaching, and, and, and a couple of times in the past few months, I've referenced Romans 12 too. And okay. I took the Weiss translation, if you ever get a chance, just on that word world, what that literally means in the Greek. I don't, you, I don't know if you've ever looked at the, the Kenneth Weiss translation and his um, definition. All these, all these books back here are rented just for this call, <laughs> by the way. I've not read any. I have to return them in an hour. So yeah, I got it. Weiss. Okay, go on. I'll, I'll see if he's in this staff. <laughs> oh, so funny. So I just loved his interpretation of what, what the word world means. Okay. And he said, all these, the axioms and the thoughts, all the things that we're breathing in and out, and many times we're not cognizant of it, but yeah. the thoughts and patterns of the world that we are, you know, we're seeing on a daily basis, many times unconsciously we're being impacted by that. So yeah. I thought that was pretty powerful. It made me think like along the lines of what you're talking about. Oh, that's exactly it. You nailed it. Yeah, we've been more discipled by the world than we care to admit. Well it's said. so ingrained yeah. and we think in these sure. patterns and they have to be, 
And when they're broken, they look so countercultural, you know, like they just look different than the world. And, and, and now we're back to, that's it. We're, we're, you know, we're in the world, but we're not of it. And that is but not. I that is being weird, right? I mean, so like you go to people in the world, do you go to church? Like, what, what do you mean? You go to, you, you go to a small group, you do this, you do, and people go, that's just weird. And it's like, you want to flip that and go, no, we're not the weird ones. <laughs> right, 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 right. Go right. Ahead. What were you going to say? No, that, I mean, you nailed it. I, I, like that. I want us to embrace the weird, I guess, uh, but yeah. we're not, we're not being odd. Um, just for being odds sake, we're being odd for God's sake. Like he's called us to this. And if that looks weird in the current context and, and it's interesting, the things that look weird in our generation will not look weird 200 years ago. And they won't, they won't be the things that make us look weird 200 years now. And that's what we like, you know, that's what we we should expect. Like, all right. So if, if this is the word of God, and it's for all time and all cultures and all of history, then we should expect quite naturally, there's going to be things about every culture that this book is going to hundred percent affirm. Yes. Like there are certain things about throughout every culture, every history, there's yes. something hundred percent affirm. Yes. And there's going to be some things that this book absolutely condemns and judges. But if it's God's truth for all history, for all time, we shouldn't be surprised then um, that our great, great grandparents picked some things to really be offended about. And we picked totally, it's totally other things to be offended about. That's a good point. You know, I remember reading the story of the prodigal son in like, um, you know, some, some, I don't remember, you know, some church in New York and everybody like cheers for the second chance of the prodigal son. <laughs> and I remember preaching that in India and everybody's like furious that the boy didn't get punished well, or, you know, whatever, because their culture valued that yeah. on the shame or whatever, you know, um, I think it, um, uh, I mean, it's getting a little off track, but no, like, no, that's good. That's what these talks are. are they're great. So I, we can uh, delve any, into other topics. I always tell like, um, like in, in Ephesians, when Paul does that children, obey your parents in the Lord. Yes. Um, uh, 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 so, so there's like people lose their mind because in that he talks about, I don't remember the order, but I think it's children, obey your parents in the Lord. Right. Slaves obey your masters, and, and people are like, what? "That's in the Bible." Right? <laughs> I can't believe and then, that. Um, and then, husband, a uh, wife submit to your husbands, right? Your husbands, and yeah. so, this requires a lot of exegesis going to that. But, but only thing I want to point out is the the, the shocker mm. in 2020 America is the first part. But for Paul, he actually used that as a way to give the Love showstopper it. was the second part, right? So, mm-hmm. so he would say, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And everybody in the ancient Near East is going, yeah, duh. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, children are like property. That, yeah. You know, of course, that, that's a given. And then he follows it with the mic drop, showstopper, cult counter. Oh, but fathers, don't exasperate your kids. You don't have a right to treat them like that. You don't have a right to treat them about you. To which everybody in America goes, no <laughs> doubt, to yeah. the second part, yeah. the first. So it's just funny that like, his second part is what's so shocking to their culture. They're like, what? Then he gets the slaves obey your, your masters, to which everybody in the Roman Empire would be like, well, duh, no yeah. kidding. Yeah. But then he says, oh, but masters, you have to treat them. Because remember, you have a master. You're, 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 they're your brother. Like, that's it's unheard of. That's, just, yeah, I mean. It's, it's cataclysmic. Yeah, it's, absolutely. And then husbands love your wives. Well, or, or, or wives submit to your husbands. Everybody's like, no husbands, kidding. Yeah. Oh, husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. So it's just like a yeah. showstopper brought their culture under judgment on the exact opposite things so that good. ours would have. And that, and that happens over and over and again. And that's what we should expect because it's the word of God for all time, for all cultures. It's, it's bound that. to like quite naturally approve of some things, you know? Um, Amazing. In fact, that's a good apologetic. If you have, like, you know, to sort of float the, before you just come in guns blazing on whatever sure. biblical point, you know, kind of like point out the ways and, to have sort of an ironic tone about it, point out some of the things that right now as a culture, the Bible would say, good, like yeah. good for American culture on, on this issue or that. You know? Yeah, no, that's good, man. That's really good. You just said a lot. I took, well, I got us off track there. Oh, but, you didn't. Hey, yeah. man, like what are some of the ways that you feel God's been using this? You know, it's been a global pause. I mean, not as much anymore um, to speak to us these last yeah. few months. Anything you'd want to yeah, I, you know, again, I'm 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 in Isaiah, so I'm hearing all these yeah. like, you know, uh, right. But um, I, for Isaiah's time, there's just so many parallels. The guy wrote what 2,700 years ago, but it sounds so modern. He's got this thing in there. I, I saw the other day. I, uh, it's like chapter seven, okay. eight, or nine, somewhere in there. He's like, 
don't call conspiracy what the people call conspiracy. And, <laughs> and I'm sitting here, you know, but um, he That's talks relevant. about like, um, you know, he talks about don't be, don't, um, you know, in, in Isaiah nine, he's talking like, you know, um, uh, don't just say, hey, the bricks have fallen, but we're going to rebuild better than ever. He's like, whoa, that's pride and arrogance. Instead, inquire of the Lord and say, God, you got our attention. Humble yourself. Right. Then we can talk about rebuilding God's way. But we, we don't just need to just blow this up. For him, it was um, Assyria. For us, it's coronavirus. For him, it was a visible enemy that was coming. Here, it's invisible. But I think it's the same thing. It's saying, hey, yeah. who's humble yourself? Hey, is God trying to get our attention and then he talks about if we don't humble ourselves instead let me see if i can find it um yeah the 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 uh, the elder and the honored uh, the lord's going to cut off head and tail the elder and the honored man's the head this is from the ninth chapter of isaiah 15 16 the prophet who teaches lies is the tail and here's the part for those who guide this people have been leading them astray and those who are guided by them are swallowed up mm -hmm. and that's the image like just like you you paint with a broad brush, you get into trouble. There are good yeah. prophets and pre, I mean, even Isaiah, he's not saying every prophet is a liar. Look at Amos. And, and that's sometimes when you talk about the media, you get into trouble because there's good journalists who are trying their best. They're doing good work, you know, so you paint with a broad brush. Sure. But I do think it's fair to say distrust in media is at an all time high. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. And people are being consumed. And I think some people over here are being consumed by news that is so politicized. I mean, we, <laughs> Brett McCracken says, when we've taken something as biologically objective as a virus, yeah. and made it, and when we have politicized a virus, we've politicized a virus, y'all. I don't think this single cell organism ever <laughs> registered to vote Democrat or Republican, like, I, you know, but we, and he says, that's how far in, that's how post into the post-truth era we've come. That's his point. Wow. We've managed to politicize the virus. So you got yeah. news that's so politicized over here. People are being consumed by it. And in reaction to that, some people are being consumed by crazy conspiracy theories in reaction to that, right? And so, bo but both the point is are being consumed by this. And so the, the answer is to go on a knowledge diet. And uh, 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 Brett, Brett, <laughs> Brett McCracken uh, if you, if you see that article, he calls it the, you remember the food pyramid? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and like eat the your antiquated food. FDA food pyramid. Yes. Yeah. That's it, to try to teach us like, Hey, sure. build everything around the fruits and veggies. And then it builds up, you know, you get to carbs and then at the very tippy top is, is fats and sweets fats. and oils. Everything that is not lechy approved that Rick <laughs> loves, you know, <laughs> Use sparingly and McCracken. I love this. He's like, "Hey, Bible, get God's word." Then, and he's, his point makes so much sense, right? Yeah. If you're consuming all these foods, you're gonna feel like garbage. Right. Well, you're consuming all this knowledge. You're you're filled with anxiety, Perfect analogy, yeah, you depression. You got low level sure. rage all the time. Sure. What are you consuming? And so he says, like, build it from the bottom up. The Bible, then the local church, right? this stuff we need each other to i see this blind spot hey did you see this in god's word then he says nature just get out and take a walk yeah. you know yeah. then books then right. the internet and then the fats and oils to use at the very tippy top and the sweets and the cookies and the cakes that's that's social media <clears throat> like dabble in it maybe twice a year you know like if maybe you we flipped it maybe uh we Bingo. flipped the pyramid yeah. And that's it. And that's why I feel like garbage because I flip the food pyramid. I eat all the fats and processed foods. No wonder. He's saying the same yeah. thing and not, you know. It, it preaches well. So, so dabble in it. Go on a knowledge diet. And, it, and if you're like, hey, Tom, what are you doing on Twitter? Oh, it's my cheat day. You know, twice a year. I, I, I you know, but, but don't consume it. Um, that's good, man. And you look at all the studies that are coming out about it and the deleterious effect it has on us is just human beings. Not yeah. even, you're talking spiritually. It's great. But just in general, the world is seeing this. The world is waking up to this. I've read, a, you know, these, a few books, I would say, over the course of the past year, just on this topic alone. Yeah. Um, so and, it's and, definitely and important. And I don't want it to sound all, like, negative. I mean, I mean, no, I say, I say also, good, oh, Absolutely. It's a lot of good that comes with, yeah. In sure. this pause, haven't you seen, too, like, the promises of God are sweeter than they've ever been? Ah. Uh. You know, the, the like, just the stuff you've always known, but now it's being tested. Like, consider the lilies of the field, Jesus says. They neither toil nor spend. 
You'll never be driving to work one day and pull up at a red light next to a Lily in his car, you know, smoking a cigarette. I got to hit the grind. I'm on my daily. I got, I got, bud, I got buds at home and, and fertilizer doesn't grow on trees, you know. And yet they're fine. And he says, so how much is the Heavenly Father going to care for you? Um, did you see uh, Tony Evans' funeral that for his wife? I did. I did. I love him, too, by the that, way. That Jonathan Evans eulogy, you know, he's praying, God, healer from a cancer healer. And he said, God spoke to me. He said, I don't think Agent. you understand. Either she's going to get healed or she's going to get healed. Either she's going to live or she's going to live. Either she's going to be with friends and family or she's going to be with friends and family. Either she's going to be okay or she's going to be okay. I mean, the place just erupts because that's what God's people know. It's just like we get to actually, it's real. And when it comes to coronavirus, for the believer, you're either going to live or you're going to live. You know, it, it's. Absolutely. So there's, I think God has, I, I, I have to think he's um, in this global pause. There's also been that sort of yeah like this is real you know yeah um i had one one guy told me he read this article from michigan and i i read it he sent it to me and the lady it's all about dying alone the indignity of dying alone Mm. and you know um he suffered alone he was a hundred percent alone right and the guy he was actually running with me one morning and he said he's a he's a really thoughtful guy um he converted to christianity later in life Wow. And he said, he said, but because of sin, now think about this. We, I preached, I said, I, with your permission, I'd just like to steal all that and, and preach it Good Friday. Yeah. He said, fine. He said, because of sin, dying alone is exactly what we deserve. Wow. But Jesus suffered. The old hymn says, right? He suffered and died alone yeah. right. so that we never would be. There's, there's no Christian that will ever die alone because beautiful. Christ died alone. That's beautiful. He never will. I was like. <laughs> yeah, that's really, that's powerful. That'll I love bring. that. That's really good. Hey, if I could move on to uh, my next question. It's funny that you should bring up Tony Evans's name. You know, I had heard recently, he came out, just recently came out with a, um, a study Bible. Do you know that? A commentary, right? Did you know he's the first African-American man to ever have a, get a, wow. a, a, a study Bible commentary wow. published? Yeah. Uh-uh. Couldn't believe that. I was, I was shocked by that. And yeah. I'd be remiss if we didn't spend a few minutes talking about what's going on in our country. And I, I remember, you know, some years ago, you preached a, an amazing sermon and you talked about the difference between American values and Christian values. And yeah. I would love for you to, to touch on that in light of the racial tension and strife that has pervaded, you know, American society today. So if you could maybe touch yeah. on that. Yeah, what I was doing with that image, it actually came up. Um, uh, I try to think of a helpful way. It actually goes back to that very first question: What's in the world, not yeah, of it? Yeah, right. Um, and I was trying. It actually came up trying to figure out how to teach my kids. Right. So now they're eleven. <laughs> right. We have a. We have a. We both have a. a, a our yeah. oldest child is the same age. Jameson is the same as Katie. But the eleven-year-old, the eight-year-old, the six-year-old now, and of course, this was years ago. Right. But I, I got to thinking. It was actually when the same-sex marriage. Uh, 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 Supreme Court thing came out when, um, oh, there was fights about bakers baking cakes. And, yeah. and then there was, and just randomly, there was the marijuana being legalized yeah. and, and stuff. Right. I know that's, that, that seems random, but what I, what I was doing for my kids was I, I wanted early on, I, I guess, I just tried to separate. And so it was a helpful image for me to be able to look at my kids and go, when we watch the news or whatever, we can talk about it. We say, oh yeah, honey, those are American values. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, the ability for like um, uh, uh, a man and a man to get married or a woman and a woman, like that, that, that's American values. There's no need to get all up in arms about it. But we have Christian values. And the thing is, there's sometimes when those align and, and, and it, it looks conveniently like they're the same thing, but never get it twisted, honey. Like never get it twisted, you know, little child that I'm trying to teach. Uh, they're not the same thing and they've yeah. never been the same thing. And only in certain bubbles has anyone been able to convince themselves that they were the same thing right and i hear it sometimes like oh yeah back in the 1950s when we had morals and we had and i'm always like not if you were african-american in 1950 it didn't feel like you know so don't yeah. like, oh yeah. that was the golden age not not for everybody oh, no no so, no so that, that but but you see those examples I, you know first peter 
is kind of our book right now as a nation. I think First Peter, we are the elect exiles. Mm -hmm. And these are exiles, not because they suddenly had a new nationality, but because they had a new faith. We, our home is a king good. and a kingdom. So totally good. different values, right? So when it comes to um, uh, all these things, uh, every now and then kingdom values and American values will overlap, but we shouldn't expect them to. I mean, can you imagine in First Peter, if some Roman citizen or some household servant or some baker was just like getting all mad because of what Fox News said about Nero. You know, so, like, <laughs> that's a good example. There, there's never a point where we were ever <laughs> under any illusion that Caesar in any way represented like God. Yeah. Um, why, yeah. why should we expect the world to act? And it may sound cynical, but I think the quicker oh, we no. kind of, the quicker we, we pop that bubble, the better. Like we, we, we shouldn't expect the world to act like anything other than the world world and the yeah. church shouldn't somehow um so what does it have to do with with race and and y you know i like i just get the sense that that part of the frustration of being a christian right now is that you're <laughs> forced into a two-party system and christians should never feel completely comfortable i'm not saying they shouldn't register a party that's fine sure. but right. if you feel like you're if you feel like you don't fit that's because you don't fit in a two-party system yeah it's so good yeah you don't, and and it's like, you know, uh, uh, package deal ethics. It's like, you know, you can't, sweeping generalization time, I guess. But like, um, you know, it, it, is poverty a systemic issue or is it a personal responsibility issue? Sweeping generalization, but and I know and I recognize that. But usually, it's like a liberal point of view to say it's a systemic. People are poor because it's a systemic issue. Yes. Systems align against them. And, and, and a more conservative view says people are poor because they're lazy. They need to work hard or whatever. And the Bible is like, yep. <laughs> like, yes. Like some people, there's some personal responsibility issues. We all know examples of that. We can also agree like the system is unfairly stacked. And the Bible's like, yeah, but you can't work on both that because you're, you're, you're immediately sort of, well, you don't fit our system or whatever. Um, you know, when, when it comes to like, race and social injustice it yeah. seems like one party will focus on that when it comes to abortion and and um family values uh, uh right. same-sex marriage whatever you've got one that's like focused on that and the other seems that seems to be like a minor court oh, i'm not talking about among christians no no yeah and i think the scripture would be like well i don't understand like yes the bible is uh, concerned about all of it you, yes. you can't separate that no, it's not just partial life. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, we get all people get all caught up and, and again, yeah. I mean, being pro-life and uh, things that are going on, obviously, you know, a baby in the womb, but it's the, I don't know, it's the womb to the tomb, right? At the end of the day, it's whole life. It's yeah. all of life, not just yeah. partial. And we can yeah. get so caught up on that. So I, I, I share your sentiments on that. That's a good point. So, um, so how do we, well, so like, you know, a lot of times people, it's like, you not only need to believe in Jesus, but you also need to believe in Jesus and be members of the fill in the blank party. And that's wow. just wrong. That's not, you Absolutely. know, Absolutely. Um, and, and it's not the other thing. And Keller points this out in his New York times article about, he talks about why Christians don't fit in a two, two party system. If you get, you, I'm sure you've seen it. If I've not, seen, or, yeah, great article. Yes. Um, so, so like there's matters of biblical command, but also practical wisdom. Right. So like, TK. Um, the Bible says care for the poor. Right. Everyone agrees on that. But there's lots of ways. How should we do that? Should we have a big yeah. socialist yeah. safety net? Or is it better to empower corporations and build from the bottom? You know, and all that. Like, well, I don't know. That, that's not – probably there's great ways. Um, racism is a sin violating, among many other commandments, uh, certainly sure. it violates the second of what yeah. Jesus calls the greatest commandment, to love your neighbor. Okay. Now, how do we tackle racism? Is it at the individual level where you and I need to start having coffee, having people in our homes, so people don't look like us? Or Good do we tackle it at the yeah. systemic level where banks are redlining districts where I ah, don't want, don't, don't, don't <laughs> put out money. You know, yes. I think the Bible would say, yes. yes. Um, I, um, so I, you know, I, in terms of the how, I, I don't know, but I, I think that more and more we, we need to look like, you brought up the word weirdo. Um, first Peter says we are elect exiles. John Piper wrote a commentary about first. Uh, I don't know. He made comments on first Peter. And I love this. He says right. we need to be. Haven't read it. 
We need to, well, it's not just a desiring God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to be the winsome weirdos. I love we that. To, we need to recapture. Winsome weirdos. Winsome weirdos, right? Sure. Weirdos because yeah. we're no longer concerned about being hip and cool. In right. terms of culture, we don't care. We are no longer as a church going to try to culturally blend in with a world that's going to judge us by worldly standards anyway. Right. That game, we're not going to play we're that. Not going to win. Yeah, it's not going to go. So we don't care. Right. We're, we're weirdos, right? We need to look. Okay. But sure. win some weirdos because these Christian weirdos are always thinking up creative ways to do good. Like that's, that's our lane. That's where we need to be. Win some weirdos. So embrace the weirdo. But then <laughs> a lot of Christians that I think are weird just because they're obnoxious. That's not what he's talking about, right? Embrace the weirdness of being set apart, a royal priesthood, but win some weirdos. Like, you can't help. So there's a church in our, um, in, it's not my church, but a church in our town that I think, in brief, like an example of win some weirdos. Last night, we had a, a group of protesters um, peacefully assembling. Yes. Um, there was no rioting or anything like that. Right. Um, but they were uh, protesting. And then there actually were some counter protesters, much smaller group, maybe like one or two people, whatever, over here. And this church happened to find itself, their parking lot was kind of, just happens to be downtown, it was whatever. And so they put a huge grill and they began serving hamburgers to both groups and the cops and just passing out food. Because in the midst of all this assembly, you may get hungry and, you know, who doesn't need a burger? I thought, that's, yes, you know. And so, you know, this group is saying, why don't you pick up a sign? They're like, you know, right, today we're just here to love on people and pass out some some food and some water. And then, uh, you know, it's a hot day. Here's a water. It might be getting hot out here. And like that, that, good. That, Yeah, that stuff. Um, no, and I, guess, I guess too, and I don't want to, you know, take us off into this, but like sociologically, I mean, you know, you look at in groups and out groups and you feel like you're seeing so much of it's us versus them. You hear so many, like yeah. you hear the different factions and you hear one group, the left or the right, again, talking, politics or, or what have you and you keep hearing that and one side just keeps looking at the other side and we have to get to a point where we realize the the um i guess the stereotypes that we carry around and the, the prejudice that all of us carry we're always looking outwardly instead of looking inwardly at some of the things that are going on inside of us we look at the white house instead of looking at our house oh yeah, yeah, yeah. going on you know what i mean yeah. So again, I don't want to get too off into that, but um, that's good with the hamburgers. That's, that's, that's great. That's really, that's powerful. Your, your church models that. And, and, and I think about my own church yeah. and new hope and new hope. I mean, here you have, and this is, this is a great example of what I'm talking of being countercultural. You have a church in city on a hill and same at right. new hope, that preaches what many people would call, because you know, if I'm just a secular humanist, I'm outside looking going, the problem yeah. is all the exclusivity. Your church and mine too preaches the most exclusive thing there is. Jesus Christ, the only way to God the Father. Yeah. I'm, you're going to split hell wide open if you reject that yeah. plan of salvation. Like that is the most exclusive thing in the world. And right. yet, and, and this is the crazy thing, Jesus Christ is the only door, but the only door is an open door. And whosoever will, will may come. And so what do you have with that? And you would think that would... But it's the most inclusive exclusivity in the world. Oh, absolutely. So you so have, well said. You have yeah. these people that are like, well, I mean, over and over in scripture, again, in Isaiah, when he pictures like the end of everything, it's these every tribe, tongue, nation, language. It sounds like revelation there yeah. before the throne, every tribe, tongue, nation, language. So the church has in its DNA, and we should expect this, um, all of the sort of, I mean, that's where we're headed. And ironically, you get there because the thing that unites me, the thing that like my identity, the thing that I'm most is not, it's not American. It's certainly not my political party. It's not even my football affiliation down here, Alabama or Auburn. <laughs> I, can, I can set that aside. It's that um, I'm a sinner saved by Jesus Christ. You're a sinner saved by Jesus Christ. And like that, that's there. That's in our DNA. I'm just repeating what other people have said, you know, better. But I just think it's it's so ironic that you get there by the inclusive only door of Jesus Christ, but the only door is this wide open door. So, and it's and it's not just true in your church and in New Hope. Look yeah. at the like yeah. churches that are exploding multi multicultural, multiracial. They're the man. They're the ones that are preaching that that hard gospel. You know, only way kind of. And, and um, it's like you know. That's so true, man. That, that I would. That, that's really well said. 
Um, but hey, I hope as we, you know, start to move forward, where do you see the church in all this? What do you, you know, because I, I think there's a, the church has to, the, the void, the, the vacuum, I guess maybe you could say, looking at culture, I, we can't really look to culture as much anymore to maybe, there's no panacea for this, but to help try to bring about healing, restoration, reconciliation, is there anything that we can do better as the church moving forward, moving out of this? I mean, I hope this is a tipping point. I'm sure you, you know, you feel the same way. I've heard, heard you know, somebody said, hey, this is a, a breaking point for America. And he, he was asked that in a, a question, somebody said that to him, is it? And he said, you know what, I'm hoping this is a breakthrough point. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's our heart, that's our prayer. But is there anything else you think we could do as the church as we move forward? <clears throat> this endeavor. Yeah. You know, James says, uh, the book of James says, yeah. um, right, be, be, um, be quick, quick to listen. Listen. Flow, to, flow to become angry. You went there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think right now, it, one of the great things about, and I'm not on social media, period. I never got on Facebook. I don't have an account. Right. Somebody okay. once told me an account has been opened up in my name on Facebook, which is a little scary, but I don't think it's accurate. <laughs> Um, which has never been on Twitter. And I realized over and over the wisdom of that is paying off in spades, you know, that I've never been on anything. Um, first of all, I don't feel the need to comment on any of that stuff. I can sit back and I can um, try to read and reflect. Um, I, I was telling you the other day about that book somebody uh, gave me, Between the World and Me. I'm reading it right now. Yeah. So that, that was, that was wow, so different. It's really yeah, good. Exactly. That was a chance for me to say, okay, let me hear from this author Coates between the world and me. Let me hear like, just let, and, and that's the advantage of a book. He can just talk and I can just listen. I don't have to like, there's no ax to grind or whatever. Um, so stuff like that, I think being, being a, the church taking the posture of quick to speak, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Um, uh, continuing our role as sort of, <laughs> The winsome weirdos, you know, the, uh, the elect exiles. And, uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking about, do you guys have any clue when you can begin regathering where you are? No, we technically, uh, I guess, can now, small numbers. Okay. Um, a church near us in the area this past Sunday when I went in to go, um, to, to go live stream and, and video, I saw they were outside, so they had like a tent, and I heard the music going. I don't know how many people were there. Yeah. Um, we don't want to be the first to, like, we want to yeah. Yeah. sit back and kind of wait and see how things play out. We want to, yeah. don't want to be the first to the party. So we just want to, again, be guided, be, just be smart about it, yeah. and wait. So, what, I mean, soft target date, I would say maybe the end of this month. That is yeah, no, and I wasn't trying to put you on your spot. No, I, no, 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 that's, no, no, I, that's for any, for any members of City on a Hill and any <laughs> no, anywhere. I don't you, think they, I didn't here. feel that way. I didn't feel that way here. at all. Yeah. It's it's amazing how many bastards. people, right? It's amazing how many people now, and I, I've even heard this from people maybe that were, I don't know, maybe I put them in the category of maybe more nominal believers. Okay. Wouldn't frequent, you know, Sunday yeah. services and just talking with a few people in the course of conversation, uh, I, I, I got to get back to church. I need to reprioritize my life. I, I realized how, so I'm like, wow. So, but I'm hoping that doesn't fizzle out. I'm hoping yeah. two months from now, right. We don't see people going, well, you know, it was good for a little while. And then we right. just go back again to our same patterns and routines. So I think that's going to be part of the challenge yeah. um, for us. Well, I've got this. I, the reason I asked, I've got this image in my head. Sure. So I, again, back to Isaiah and, um, Ask me anything about the first 12 chapters, because that's all I preached on. I have no idea what happens in 13 to 66. I know there's a suffering servant, but anyway, he, um, he says, like, to, to the people of, of Judah, he's like, I mean, he's not pulling any punches, and he's talking, and he, he calls them Sodom and Gomorrah, and, yes. and, and, and they're God's people. And so they're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Wait uh, a second. Yeah. yeah. And he said, and they say, what about all our Sabbaths? What about, have you seen the temple? It's full and all this. And Isaiah just, I mean, he was waiting on that it's fastball. Great. He's like, come on, give it to me. And so he talks about, um, he just goes off. He's like, yeah, but the Lord wants to know these, don't bring these vain offerings. This is nothing to me. You think this is what I want? A bunch of bulls, a bunch of the trappings of worship going through the motions. Right. He's, he talks about how I'm, I'm sick of it. I despise it. One commentator said, 
what on earth could make God fold his arms and go, do we have to go to church today? You know, like, well, anyway, he's going off on it. And, and his point is, it's God's people. And I'm just, I'm, I just have this vision in my mind. Sure. I've been on so many of these Zoom calls and webinars, wow. and there's all these little, I call it the Brady Bunch, right? We're all looking around. <laughs> the at the, Brady Bunch. At the little, at the little box. I remember that. Yeah. And I've been on, the ones I've been on with pastors have been, I mean, they're credible, they're encouraging, it's great, yes. but there's like hundreds of them, and I'm scrolling through, right. and the topic is always, okay, because in Alabama, obviously, we've been allowed to reopen a little more quickly, yes. for better or worse. Yeah. Um, but, but, but it's all about this checklist. Everybody's got these like steps to a safer return. And like, you know, do, have you thought about social distancing? Have you thought about ventilation? Have you thought about sanitation? Have, do you have enough hand sanitizer? Can you, what about the supply chain? It goes on and on. I just picture on this Zoom call, how awesome, if like suddenly you look up in the corner and there's Isaiah, like on the Zoom call and everything. And he like somehow mutes everybody else. And he's like, you know, I, brother Isaiah, what do you think about all this? And he's like, um, I think you're asking the wrong question. And it's not, should we reopen if we have enough sanitizer? Should we reopen if we have this? The churches should not reopen until they repent and turn back and revive, you know, or something like that. To which you can imagine the whole Zoom call being like, okay, Brother Isaiah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's but powerful. I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's his powerful. message. And that, that was my message, I think, to... um to like, you know, to our people is we're all asking these questions about what does it look like to regather? And I think Isaiah is saying, don't open the doors of the church until you hit your face and you humble yourself before a holy God and say, this is not about whatever it looks like. This is, this is about our hearts. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's so true because I'm with you, whether it was on Christian leader, outreach, Christianity today, I mean, a plethora of articles talking to what you're saying. Exactly. After a while and us meeting virtually, you know, a few of us in person, exactly. It's like hitting this, you know, graphs and charts. And I'm like, really? Like, this is, this is crazy. But I love that. First and foremost, we can't lose sight of that. Yeah. That's good. Everything's yeah. reopen and, and rebuild and recover. And Isaiah is saying, repent, return, revive. Different- we don't like that word, though. We don't like that word. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Turn around. We don't, we don't, we don't want to yeah. do that. We just want to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, man. Really good. Hey, I'm going to hit you with one more question. Here we go. Right? You, can, you can go off on this. Um, so last question I gave you in light of the post-Christian age, right, that we yeah. find ourselves these days. What do you think is the most effective way to getting the gospel to the people? You, you kind of touched on a little bit of this earlier in the conversation. So if you want to take this in another direction, you can. Um, that's up to you. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a great question. I, I think it's um, – uh, probably all that stuff, sort of de- decoupling, decoupling yeah. right. our notion that in any way, American values should always line up with Christian values. Uh, you know, the world's going to act like the world. One of the best things you said in this conversation. Yeah. I, so I think we've got to just decouple that. Get that out of your head. Because otherwise, all your prayers become, if we could get our political party in power, if we could just get this news outlet to start telling the truth, if we could, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Our right. role is faithful presence faithful presence, right? That, so my job as a believer every day, faithful presence. Now, my, part of my faithful presence, if, I, if, I, if I'm on a Senate subcommittee and I have a chance to shape some policy in a way that I think reflects right. the heart of God, then that's my faithful presence, you know? Right. Um, it, you know, if Tell it's- Tell talk to that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and it, 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 part of my faithful presence might be standing with the, the Black Lives Matter um, a, a group of a pro, peaceful protest. If that's my faithful presence, that's what God's called me to. That may be another example of you know faithful presence, or um, or remaining silent on social media while the nations rage. You know, just kind of r- remaining silent. Uh, um, but but I think that that, that that decoupling, and then I think stuff like stuff like we're doing right now. I mean, you can't at the end of the day. Um, Let me interject something because what you just said again, you made me think of it. You know, Megan and I were in a conversation last night and she said to me, you know, I feel as if um, there are people out there saying, if I don't say something on social media that, you know, that I, I, I should, that, so she feels like her silence is deafening to people if she doesn't say anything. So we just had that whole debate, but I'm kind of with you. I don't know how productive a lot of the debates and discussions are 
on social media. And again, it's when you're not having that face-to-face -face communication, how much gets lost in translation, right? And I just, it's, I think it's dangerous for us. So I'm glad again that you're, you're hitting on that. And I think we need to be, use wisdom in terms of what we write, especially on social media, what we're saying. It's easy to get involved. It's easy to get upset. I mean, how many, I don't know. I've done it before where you want to write something and you're like, I can't write this. Really? I mean, like yeah. you got to reflect, yeah. ruminate on, wow, what does this really mean if I, I send this out there? And then it's out there. I mean, yeah, you can delete things, but really at the end of the day, there's always a fingerprint, right? For oh, yeah. You do and say, so that's, that's a little dangerous. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, yeah. And I mean, no, I mean, that's great. I mean, what, like, what if you're what if you're asked something and you, you're really you're, you're really wrestling through it and you realize there's so much nuance yes. and your response is I'm still forming what I think about these things I don't know right that no one says that everyone has an answer Tom in our culture everybody has the answer so I've never what, when are we going to see that you're right? not well you're not you're Before not Lord tarries I'd love to see that I'd love to yeah. see somebody come on and say yeah, I'm wrestling with this issue and I don't really know where I stand. And then if the person did that though, they who, I mean, I can't even imagine what would happen. They would be bombarded, but right? Can you imagine what that, what that would do, the divide? So, but that's a good point. A very well, worse, good point. worse, I think, is it would get no press at all. Like that doesn't you sell think? anything. Yeah, I wonder. You, never, you never hear about that person. That's why they never get elected. <laughs> they don't exist. It's not real. <laughs> no, it's not real. Yeah. So we should come up with like a fictitious, like, like a, just some fake account and like, yeah and go on there with some face of person, some person we don't know and throw that out there and try to, yeah. I don't know, see what happens. That, that would be funny. About, but think about what you're saying, where we've come. If you started yeah. a fake Twitter account that, <laughs> yeah. was ra that was rational, humble, nuanced, and thoughtful, it would be the most egregious, outrageous <laughs> thing imaginable right now. It's like, like what? Like, oh, that is an excellent point. That is so true. Yeah. 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 Hey. So, you know, anything, you know, I mean, we hit all of my questions, but anything else that you see going on, anything else you just wanted to share with the people? Hey, what do you miss most about New York, if I could ask you? What do you miss most about being up here? It's going to be a, probably a, you love food, man. You know it's food. <laughs> it has to be food. I mean, the right answer is the people and the relationships. No, and the I know. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. yada, yada. Yeah, they're nice right. too. <laughs> well, there was a, a, a little like routine I got into, um, uh, you know, you remember that I, I, on the Sundays that I was, you guys were so gracious to invite me to come and, and speak. I would speak. I know where you're going. And then I had to kind of prepare for, um, for like, uh, uh, New Hope, which had those two services that night. And if there was a prayer meeting before or anything like that, so it was kind of, yeah. things had to happen quick. Sure. Um, but I always indulged on uh, on uh, 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 Middle Island Road. What, what's the road? Middle uh, uh, Middle Island, uh, Middle Country no, Road. Middle yeah. Country Road. Yeah. Heading back, uh, heading back toward heading Queens. Back to New Hope. There was right. a little bagel place, and I'd whip in there, and I'd get oh, and, and you know we became friends, and the lady <laughs> found out I was a pastor, so she said, you know, I got these are going to go to waste. Give them to your prayer meeting or whatever. Um, right. And I always remember that first bite. I mean, the cream cheese they put on that oh, thing. Like, hey, cream cheese is expensive. I never understood that. Why would they waste so much cream cheese? It, it boggles the store, mind. It's like five bucks for a, a, a tub of, you know, yeah. whatever, you know, yeah. cream cheese is. Yeah. So you miss that. You miss the bagels, not the same pizza, the gluten. You yeah, miss the gluten, bro. I would have a day of gluten. And then I would preach my heart out at New Hope. And then that night when everything was done, Jackie and I would order pizza. So my day would begin and end with gluten and that's just that's I new heaven new earth bro you're gonna get <laughs> hey I just want to I want to tell the people too hey you can go on um you can go online and, and still listen to Pastor Tom's sermons yeah uh, I think I'm gonna get your a sermon link and I'm gonna okay. put that there on our on Realm uh and right. Facebook too whatever I'm gonna throw that up there so people can still follow you if they're not you know some people maybe not as tech savvy um, I'm not going to say me, but maybe you. Uh, so that, that would be great. Hey, I so appreciate you. Oh, man. I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. You've got a lot of meetings. You've got a lot going on. Even, you know, excluding what you've got going on personally with yeah. Jackie and the kids. I'm glad to hear everybody's doing well. We're good. Yeah. We're and, good. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you soon soon we'll stay in touch yeah i love but, this i miss this yeah, i mean yeah, i miss it too man even like when we talk and pete we had a conversation 
people wouldn't know. But we had a conversation this week, and that was that was unbelievable. Just talking about different things and different topics, and and that book. That's why I picked up that book. I had someone. Hey, I had somebody else tell me about that same book two oh, days no. ago. We had a conversation. Oh, you're okay. Yeah, oh, and we were talking about we were talking about race. Jamal, you remember Jamal? Jamal. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had mentioned it to me that he read it. He's like, you know, it's a great book. So I said, that's so funny. Pastor Tom mentioned it as well. So I picked that up. But I'm so thankful for you. Thankful for our friendship. Thankful for all that you've done. Um, it's city on a hill and and you know what you did at new hope and what you're doing down there doing the lord's work in in coleman alabama and uh i can't wait to watch the crimson tide baby a couple of months <laughs> hey love you i right, love uh, you i'll talk to you soon brother all right. all right be well say hi to the fam i will you too all right